All right, I'm here to talk to you about the origins of, uh, I think, the contemporary concept of social justice uh, as it works itself out and as you will all, by the end of the talk, I hope and trust, will recognize. And I'm going to begin with a quotation from a man well known here in Canada. Let me just begin with a quotation. You know, at some point, you are killing life in the fetus in self-defense. Of what? Of the mother's health or her happiness or her social rights or her privilege as a human being? I think she should have to answer for it and explain. Now, whether it should be to three doctors or one doctor or to a priest or to a bishop or to her mother-in-law is a question you might want to argue. You do have a right over your own body. It is your body. But the fetus is not your body. It's someone else's body. And if you kill it, you'll have to explain. Now, this quotation is from a certain Mr. Trudeau, the leader of the Liberal Party of Canada. For many Canadians, Trudeau represents Canadian values. He was voted number three in the CBC's greatest Canadian poll after uh, Tommy Douglas and Terry Fox. Says a bit about the CBC's viewers as much as anything else, I would say. But still, by many accounts, a very highly influential uh, Canadian. Here's another quote from Mr. Trudeau. The policy going forward is that every single Liberal MP will be expected to stand up for women's rights to choose. Now, we, if you listen carefully, we, you might be forgiven for being confused on this point. Apparently, a mother does not need to answer or explain to anyone at all. Abortion is not killing life in the fetus. It's not a matter of legal accountability. Mr. Trudeau declared, in fact, further, that it was an absolute right, in fact, a fundamental charter right. Furthermore, in this absolute assertion of group rights, the rights of women, individual rights, freedoms, and responsibilities have been abrogated all the way up to Canadian Parliament itself. To be an elected uh, Liberal MP now means to be denied the individual freedom of conscience and moral responsibility. The confusion, if you're comparing and contra contrasting the two quotes, is, stems from the fact that the second quote comes 42 years after the first. The speaker is still the leader of the Liberal Party of Canada, and it is still Mr. Trudeau. It's just that the latter is the son, Justin. Now, Justin's father would not be seen as a man who liberalized abortion policy in 1969 in his omnibus bill. He would be seen, I think, as an arch-conservative, at least according to his judge, uh, the judgment of his son. He wouldn't even be able to run for a liberal uh, MP's uh, seat. He would be on the rightmost fringe of the Conservative Party. I want to, in this talk, explain how in that course of 42 years, uh, we've come this far how social justice has come to occupy such an important place, and the nature of what we call social justice. Now, Mark Knoll, who many of you will know, he's a historian at the University of Notre Dame now, in a little booklet, which I highly recommend to you, called Whatever Happened to Christian Canada, talks about Canada up until the 1960s, certainly in the 50s, being in many ways more Christian than its neighbor to the south. It's a matter of surprise to Americans to hear this, uh, but uh, he says, on, by many measures and standards, that would be the case. And Toronto, for that matter, was the center of the evangelical world. The missionary movements, uh, many begin here. The first Urbana conference took place at the University of Toronto in 1946. So how did that ha come about that there was such a seismic uh, change there? That is the question to the point where now, if you think about progressive values, you will identify it with Canada and a strong anti-Christian sentiment to go with it. Well, I'm old enough, still beautiful enough, I might add, but <laughs> old enough to remember, uh, to remember the Cold War and the strong tension I felt in Canada growing up between the communists and what was then called the, th the free world. 
And I say between quite deliberately because as a Canadian growing up in the 70s and 80s, uh, Canada positioned itself somewhere in the middle. I don't know what exactly that means. You're, you're half free and half communist, not entirely clear. And it was never clear to us either, but we're somehow in the middle here. I remember watching the fall of the Berlin Wall on TV in 1989, the final year of my undergrad degree. Uh, and shortly after that, in fact, a year on, I was in Germany. I lived there, as was Randy uh, mentioned in the introduction. Uh, I lived in Germany for three years, and the fellow I shared accommodation with was a trainee surgeon from Leipzig, Germany, who escaped to the west through the Czech border when it opened up, and he thought it was going to open up temporarily, and it was going to close again, and he took his opportunity and he was out. He didn't know the wall was going to fall down. But I heard a lot about East Germany and about communism as a consequence. Two years of speaking about that. By the way, he spoke Russian and Bulgarian, almost, almost no English, just to give you a sense of how much times have changed. Now, the spectacular and sudden collapse of the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc, I studied history as well, so this was, for me, a fascinating thing. It meant that communism had almost overnight ceased to be a threat. And for those of us who grew up in the shadow of the Cold War, this was extraordinary, extraordinary. And it just went like that. And there was a sense that the new left of the 1960s, this political movement in the, in the Democrat Party and then the NDP and then the Liberal Party of Canada had probably also seen its day. It was on a path of decline. By 1989, communism had clearly failed as a philosophy. And even in academia, it became increasingly rare to meet someone who was an overt Marxist. Uh, willing to acknowledge that he was, because it was so ridiculous. Uh, one of the exceptions was a, a, a Russian historian friend of mine in Germany who, uh, in his Russian class, was studying uh, Russian with an old Marxist, committed Marxist, who was learning Russian in order to understand Marx in the original. And that doesn't strike you as funny. Marx was a German. So this poor old German learning trying to learn Marx in the original by learning Russian. Um, shows how out of touch he was with things. But at any rate, an academic by the name of Francis Fukuyama uh, wrote a little essay a few months after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. It was called The End of History. Talk about an arrogant title. The End of History. And he rather triumphalistically prophesied that and I quote, what we may be witnessing is not just the end of the Cold War or the passing of a particular period of post-war history, but the end of history as such. That is the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. End quote. Two years later, syndicated columnist George Will, many of you know him, pronounced in Newsweek that the 60s are dead. And it is absolutely true that as a unified political movement, the new left of the 1960s and the 70s collapsed along with the communists. But they never went away. Uh, they remained active, particularly in the learning institutions, in the universities. Uh, and they radicalized, and even, uh, to use a metaphor, they metastasized in the form of special interest groups. Some of their influence, like political correctness, a term that you will know, was already in evidence when I was in school, uh, in university rather, in the 1980s. Um, but it, that influence expanded, if anything. So if I use words like multiculturalism, uh, tolerance, reproductive rights, uh, political correctness, safe sex, safe schools, inclusive schools, diversity, sensitivity training, and even today's topic, social justice, we'll all recognize a vague connection with the politics of the left. But we'll also recognize that every political party of every political stripe, even those that identify themselves with conservatives, are not going to distance themselves from those things. And we won't, but on the other hand, we won't be able to point to a single thinker who's brought those into our vocabulary. And we're not going to want to dif dif distance ourselves from those if this were a problem, because we want to stand for diversity and safe sex and inclusion and tolerance and so forth. 
But what I want to submit to you then this morning is that the cultural values Im embedded in these phrases are really simply expressions of a very complex and broad-ranging ideology called cultural Marxism. Cultural Marxism. Now, cultural Marxism, unlike its better known political and economic counterpart, lasted well beyond the collapse of the communist political entities. And to some extent, it accelerated its advance precisely because it was believed in the West that communism had ceased to be a threat. After the Soviet Union fell, the threat was gone of communism. But it, made, it has made those advances precisely because those who call themselves conservatives, I'm not just speaking of Christians here, but that sort of sense of conservative politics, they've continued to act as if communism had only ever taken the form of a political and economic movement. And that what distinguished the East and the West had nothing to do with the cultural structures that presupposed and encouraged the Christian faith and the centrality of the family. So we could ignore the arts, the education system, uh, the welfare agencies, the health care system. These were all matters of uh, common ground. They weren't a matter of culture. They weren't really a matter of dispute. In other words, though, what it is because culture has long been seen to be, at best, at best, a secondary matter, a matter of private opinion, not a matter of the public good that this has advanced. Christians have been far too easily influenced, this is my analysis of this, far too easily advanced by a very anti-Christian Enlightenment philosopher by the name of David Hume. Now, others followed in his wake, but David Hume is probably the originator of the thought of what we call the fact-value distinction. I'll, I'll summarize it very briefly. Science is objective because it, it deals with facts. It deals with the realm of fact. Its findings are objective. We can not dispute its findings precisely because they are scientific. Whereas the arts, and we include religion under that category, the Christian faith, is entirely subjective because it deals with values, which have been accepted as true, but really they're just a matter of private opinion. They're not a matter of objective verification. Now, the reason I say that this uh, distinction that Hume introduces between a fact on the one hand that science talks about and a value on the other hand that the arts and uh, ethics and religion deals with is absurd is because that distinction is clearly a value judgment itself. Right? That is a value judgment that these are facts and these are values. That's a value judgment. That's not an objective uh, assessment of things. Or are, you, are we saying that there's really no such thing as objective moral standards that everyone can see and acknowledge? Well, C.S. Lewis actually addresses this issue back in a little booklet called The Abolition of Man back in the 1940s. It's already a problem back then, so this is not a new, that per se is not a new development. It's been accepted, even though it's patently false. But so broadly accepted is this delusion about the distinction between facts and values uh, by the so-called mainstream of conservative politics, whether uh, the Conservative Party of Canada or the UK or the Republican Party in the US, uh, that these parties have seen the substance of their appeal and indeed their politics to reside in the common pursuit of, uh, common sense rather, of pursuing fiscal conservatism as opposed to social liberalism. And so you can call yourself a, a fiscal conservative and still call yourself a conservative, but you can combine that with social liberalism. In Canada, this is extremely common. I don't need to explain to you this. Uh, our current mayor, that is his whole shtick. You know, I am a conservative fiscally, but I'm socially liberal. And that will be the ma mainstream in the conservative party, I would say here. Never mind uh, the po parties that you would identify uh, with uh, being further on the left. So the economy is the facts around which we unite, not the values upon which we divide. 
And if a party ma man wants to move to the middle, then he's going to do what Bill Clinton says and put the little memo in front of himself, it's the economy, stupid. Let's go to the common ground. This is the solid facts of the matter, never mind the values. Now this is what is called the reasonable position of compromise even if it actually entails the very same godless materialism that Karl Marx assumed. It's the exact same thing, same philosophy. One's a little more communitarian, the other's a little more individualistic, but basically they regard the facts to be economic about life. That's the only thing that is a fact. And what this has meant is that even some Christians have sought to avoid the social issues in the name of being reasonable. And this has allowed the open ground for the new left to come in with its cultural Marxism because it does not assume these things. It knows that values are central to uh, all politics and indeed all human life. But the reason that it's particularly relevant to our discussion here is that since its inception, as far back as the end of the First World War, the principal stated aim of cultural Marxism has been, one, the destruction of Western culture and values, and two, in particular, all vestiges of the Christian faith. It's di directly, deliberately, self-consciously seeking to eradicate the Christian faith from Western culture. And we have witnessed from the fall of the Berlin Wall, the long, slow march through the institutions, uh, become now a raging charge with no impediment whatsoever. They have run us to the river on this. And having seen the cultural uh, effect of this, we're now seeing signs of political and economic collapse. Now, I don't know if you addressed this or not, Joe, or not, I thought you would have. That is, now this is the irony. We'll just stick to the politics and the economics and we'll leave the cultural alone. Well, we've left the cultural alone and now we have a demographic winter, uh, inflationary policies and so forth, and the politics and the economics are gonna go down with it because we no longer think that the family and its significance is central to our culture and that the Christian faith is central to all legal and faithful business, etc. Now this is largely because of a widespread capitulation by Christians on the implications of Christ's Lordship. From the very beginning of the church, in the first centuries, the church was involved in its own ventures in health, welfare, and education, and Christianity also framed and shaped the laws of the West for 1,500 years. 1,500 years, and Christians understood they were to be involved in these, and they were to do so not just be because they were uh, in the world, but because this is a way of expressing Christ's kingdom reign that he not only allowed, but encouraged, mandated, in fact, go out into the world and preach the gospel, right? Disciplining the nations, etc., teaching them all that I've commanded. Now, the, and the fallacious idea of neutrality in the area of culture, a, w a way of saying that values don't matter, has finally done its work. Deceiving uh, Christians, and when I say Christians, most of my contemporaries, even in the public university, even the Christian university, still buy into the myth of neutrality. They still buy it. They still think that the Christian assumptions that they grew up with as young people are neutral assumptions, and they're just absolutely mystified by the way that the political culture of our day is going after common sense things like the family and its definition. Who would ever have thought that this were possible? They're mystified. They still believe the myth of neutrality that the cultural left re regards as a Christian concept. The, the, by the way, the left is correct on this. It is a Christian concept. And furthermore, it is also a, an objective truth about human nature that ought to bind everyone together. Both of those things are true. And the scandal about this is not just that uh, Christians of the orthodox persuasion have by and large left the field open 
to the opponents of the Christian faith. You know, the Gospel Coalition south of the border, most of us uh, are very happy with this, including myself, but they have one plank. One plank, the justification by faith on the imputed righteousness of Christ. Uh, a plank that I uh, thoroughly support. But they seem to think that there's no difference between the justification by faith and the entire kingdom of God. Let's just talk about justification all day long. Whereas my old, as my old pastor Bob File used to say, it takes a whole Bible to preach a whole Christ to make whole Christians. What do we learn about the kingdom of God from the New Testament? To learn about the kingdom of God, you have to learn about what God's kingdom was like to begin with. It, the, 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 the king has laws. Where are the laws to be found? They're found in the Old Testament. And it's very interesting, and just in terms of technology, this is just a sidebar, that uh, we have one book called the Bible. It's a technological development, and it has a, if I can use a complicated word, a, a hermeneutic significance. What we're saying here is that this is all saying the same thing, right? We don't talk about the 66 books of the Bible. We do sometimes for the purposes of genre and various other things. But they've stuck it together in one book to be read as a whole. And if you leave out a part of it, in fact, the majority of it, the first two-thirds of it, then you have truncated your understanding of God's counsel to a very narrow platform. You're effectively putting yourself in Marcion's shoes, whether you've recognized it or not. And it has left the very theologically suspect emergent church to speak to the cultural issues of our day. Whereas the Orthodox Christians are sitting there silently in the background talking about the atonement. As, as important as that is, that's all we talk about. It's a one-trick pony. And the youth are drawn to the emerging church. They're drawn to them precisely because they're speaking about social justice. The very things that they're hearing about in their public schools, where they're also going, by the way. And the church, these emergent church people, they're talking about social justice. Oh, I can be a Christian and think about social justice. Well, yes, you can. But what the emerging church is calling social justice is not what the Bible calls social justice. We'll hear more about that this afternoon. But the vacuum on the matter of justice has been left to the cultural Marxists, and they have wholly inverted Christ's kingdom's kingdom values, which are the, is the ground of all freedom. All shalom is in Christ's kingdom being here on earth as it is in heaven. And we now have a highly illiberal and intolerant brand of liberalism gaining acclaim as the banner of progress in Western political life. I mentioned Justin Trudeau. He openly, proudly exclaimed, here's where I stand on this issue. What alarmed me wasn't just how radical the statement was, it was that he wasn't publicly denounced for it by the middle. Where's the middle? He's the Liberal Party, he allegedly stands for the middle anyway. As we say, he would have kept, his father would have been out of his political party. Where's the middle? Furthermore, it's obvious that the official policies of inclusion are quite shamelessly restricting the freedom of speech and religion of Christians in the public square. We're seeing that right now in Trinity Western University. Right? You're aware of this. Even though the freedom of uh, expression and of religion are fundamental rights in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, put together by Pierre Trudeau, by the way, 1982, for those of you who are a bit younger, those are that the first rights right there, they're fundamental rights. Well, they're being abrogated by our political culture now. Now, what is happening here is we are entering a new age of fundamentalism. This is a new fundamentalism. Yeah. Now, it is symptomatic of the problem that it's not being called fundamentalism. Because we, of course, if we're inclusive and tolerant, then we're not going to call ourselves fundamentalists. It, but, and it's because it's, that's our confirmation bias. 
You know, we stand for everything. But the contradictory evidence that we are in a fundamentalist age, a new fundamentalist age, is incontrovertible. If they were just superficial accommodations, well, we're just going to include gays in marriage. We're going to include other genders besides the two that we see connected with biological sex. If these were just superficial accommodations, they could not possibly displace fundamental rights in our law and polit political practice. But they are doing so, and they're being accepted uh, politically so, and the law societies of Canada or the provinces are fighting against charter rights in the name of the new fundamentals. You can't replace a fundamental with a superficial thing. It has to be a new fundamental. Do you, does that make sense? You can't, you can't abrogate a fundamental right with just a superficial accommodation. You have to regard this as more fundamental. And only a new and contradictory fundamental can do that. And that fu the fundamental character of that new fundamental is to eradicate the freedoms of the West, which is the explicit aim of cultural Marxism all along. And the fact that it is religious in nature is revealed by the fact that marriage, which is an established Christian right, central to the Christian faith, an expression of Christ's uh, relationship to his people on earth, uh, is being redefined in countries where not only the customs but the majority of the inhabitants would still publicly identify with Christianity. The fact that that fundamental uh, institution is being redefined makes it clear that this is a religious imposition, a religious fundamental being brought right into the heart of Western culture. And where they do dissent, Christians are being conspicuously punished. You know this. It's in the media all the time. You're fearful of it yourself. I don't want to speak out or somebody's going to take me to a human rights tribunal. What is the human, what is the human right? What is the human, how do you define the human? To my mind, the, any discussion of social justice needs to deal with the influence of cultural Marxism, so let's talk about that a bit more, because I think it is new to most of us, and that's what I'm here to talk about. Now, I think most people know uh, that Marx and his followers predicted that the proletariat, which is the working classes, would, because of the economic conditions, eventually revolt against um, their... Uh, the factory owners, and they would seize the means of production for themselves in a violent political revolution against the, uh, what they called the reactionary bourgeoisie. And it, Marx predicted, and his followers predicted, the next big conflict, the next big world war, that's when it's going to happen. But much to the chagrin of the Marxists, in the First World War, the war happened. But the revolution didn't except in the Soviet Union, Russia at the time. When the First World War broke out, working men lined up in their millions, in fact, to fight against their country's enemies. They didn't say, this is the time for the working people to revolt against their masters. They said, we are opposed to this, and we're going to stand working class with the aristocracy, with the kings, etc. We're one. We're with you. Didn't spread. This led to a great deal of soul-searching among the Marxists. Some continued to try and promote political and economic Marxism and Leninism. They, had a, they posed a direct threat to the West. We recognize that. That's the Soviet Union. That's communist China. They were a political, military, economic threat. No doubt about that. But the indirect threat was far greater and far more pernicious. Now, there are two men that I want to name uh, that will probably be new to you who are important in this. One was named Antonio Gramsci of Italy. The other was uh, George or Georg Lukács of Hungary. They concluded that the Christianized West stood in the way of worldwide communism. It was the Christian faith that was the obstacle to the workers overthrowing their masters. And the social justice that Marxism rec represented, the obstacle was Christianity. 
And Gramsci noted that Christianity had been dominant in the West for two millennia. It wasn't just that the bourgeoisie, the middle classes, the property were tied to the church and that its teaching was interwoven through Western law and political structures. He noted it had even corrupted the mindset of the working man. They didn't even recognize that uh, the middle classes and the aristocracy were their enemies. And he said that it was the Christian worldview, not his words, mine there, uh, infused throughout the West that would have to be subverted. So he and the cultural Marxists that followed him concluded that the West would have to be de-Christianized, not by revolution, but more slowly through what he termed a long, slow march through the institutions. So as to fundamentally rework the culture and turn it against the Christian faith. Now, according to the cultural Marxists, every formative cultural institution, starting with the traditional family, but including schools, the media, the arts, civic organizations, the legal profession, the healthcare profession, the welfare agencies, the uh, methodology of every academic discipline, the understanding of human nature, even the churches themselves, should be brought on board with the project of the cultural Marxists. And they've been working at it for 70 years now, not 80. And in order for communism to be realized, the Christian roots of the West would have to be systematically uprooted and its institutions transformed Sorry. Uh, so that they may realize what Friedrich Nietzsche first called the transvaluation of all values. So let me explain what I mean by that phrase. So what Christianity exalted must become deplorable. What Christianity deplored must be exalted and publicly celebrated. It must become a matter of pride, what was considered to be disgusting and degrading. So what Christianity exalted, marriage, must become deplorable. What Christianity deplored must be exalted. Furthermore, Marx's proletariat would also have to be reimagined. It's not just the working man. The working man was too much tied to the natural family, a Christian institution. Gramsci argued that we need to expand our, our base here, that we need to have a new proletariat. Well, let's include criminals, women, and racial minorities. Funny alliance there. And the even more influential Hungarian writer, Georg Lukács, uh, agrees with him through, and through a program of what he called cultural terrorism, introduced radical sex education into Hungarian schools. Lukács re recognized that by attacking Christian sexual ethics, he would undermine the family. And with it, the Christian faith. So he organized sex lectures with graphic illustrations instructing the youth in what he called free love, sound familiar, before the 60s, uh, as well as teaching them to mock Christian sexual morality and monogamy, as well as to rebel against their parents' authority and that of the church. Taught in the schools, the state schools. And he simultaneously ridiculed parents and his country's priests through a propaganda blitz. Now, the effect the effectiveness of this strategy has been amply uh, documented in a book by uh, Mary Eberstadt called How the West Really Lost God, which talks about the uh, combination of the attack on the family with the attack on the Christian faith has proved to be so decisive. It used to be in, in 19th century liberalism, they went after Christian doctrine. Didn't work. It worked amongst the theological liberals. They were already gone anyway. It didn't change things, though. What changed things was when they broke the family apart. And then the attacks on liberalism go with, uh, on, uh, on theology go with it. And that is why Christianity is perhaps becoming, against the historical precedent, interestingly here, uh, more of a middle-class phenomenon in our day. Because in our day, it is the poor who suffer the most from broken families and often seem most hostile to the Christian faith. And the, the left in its politics goes to those people and say, we stand for you. Even though I would say it's their policies that have broken apart 
the very people that they purport to be helping. So the instances of, of uh, the, uh, the implosion of African-American families since the 1970s are spiked. And the abortion rates, you could talk about the racism in that. At any rate, I would get off track to speak more about that. But after Lukács, this uh, Hungarian fellow, and his party were overthrown in Hungary by an invading Rome, Romanian army, he turned up in Germany. This is a key point in 1923, one of the keynote speakers of a Marxist study week. The man who funded it, a man of fabulous wealth, was so impressed that he used his millions to set up a think tank. That think tank started off as the Institute for Marxism, but then they thought, you know what, that's a little bit too crass and overt. Let's call it something more innocuous. innocuous. It called itself the Institute for Social Research instead. Eventually, it was just called the Frankfurt School. The Frankfurt School. For those of us who are uh, philosophers, we will have heard of that. For everyone else, probably not. Now, the Frankfurt School is the originator of what we now call political correctness and the idea of multiculturalism. I think that'll surprise some of us. I think some of us think that uh, multiculturalism was the brainchild of Pierre Elliott Trudeau. The Frankfurt School drew together such writers as uh, Theodore Adorno, the most important of them, uh, the psychologists Eric Fromm and Wilhelm Reich, who promoted feminism and matriarchy, and a young man by the name of Herbert Marcuse. Now, I'm gonna talk about Marcuse in depth towards the end here. He's the most important figure in recent times. In fact, if you've never heard of him before, this is gonna knock your socks off, I hope. Not what I'm saying, but the actual implications of uh, this man whom you may never have heard of. Uh, but Marcuse expanded Gramsci's new proletariat to include homosexuals, lesbians, and transsexuals as well. And he adopted Lukács' radical sex ed and cultural terrorist tactics to promote them as well. It was Marcuse and the Frankfurt School employing Freudian psychology that would pathologize Christian morality, deeming it a cause of phobias, so you're homophobic. They, they came up with the phrase, 1967-68, the phrase first occurs. You pathologize a Christian moral view as a fear. That's what a phobia is. Uh, but the influence of cultural Marxism didn't remain in Germany because of a political event. Uh, just as in Italy, where Mussolini ousted Gramsci, and in Hungary, where the Romanians ousted Lukács, uh, Hitler and the Nazis ousted the Frankfurt School. It's one case of a, of a bad regime ousting another bad guy. Now, what happened with this is these gentlemen then moved across the Atlantic and set up base in the United States. Now, the question of why the Lord did this and allowed this is a broader question, uh, which would require much discussion and obviously speculation, because nothing happens without a purpose. And I do think there's a punishment going on here. Why exactly has uh, North America and the US in particular suffered this? But it seems to me that there is a hostility to the word of God in every area of life, and this is the punishment for it. That's my brief analysis. But, New but the uh, Frankfurt School relocated to New York City. And the target of destroying Western culture, Western civilization, then moved from Germany, where the Nazis didn't need any help to destroy Western civilization, to the United States. Now, most of the school did go back to Germany, but, uh, and I lived, as I said, in Germany in the 90s, and you could see the work of the cultural Marxists filled the university bookshops. People I'd never heard of at that point. The bookshops were full of them. Uh, who's this guy Eric Fromm? Who's Herbert Marcuse? Who is Theodore Adorno? No idea. Who is the, uh, what is the Frankfurt School? I haven't heard of that either. All the people I was coming in contact with were reading these gentlemen, and I had to engage with it. I thought, I always wondered, look, I'm a translator of German, my certified translator, I never use it. Why was I in Germany? 
Well, we have a classical school now, and I've been acquainted with cultural Marxism. That's at least part of the answer there, it, looking back on my life. Um, but let me talk about the influence of the cultural Marxists in the U.S. Four main areas where they were influential. First of all, in the media and the entertainment in industries. Initially, the Marxists were opposed to uh, culture themselves. They thought it was beneath them. Culture is a bourgeois imposition. They didn't care about culture. But under uh, Adorno's leadership, the Frankfurt School, um, sorry, under the, uh, sorry, with the influence of Walter uh, Benjamin, the Frankfurt School decided that culture is important and we need to get involved in radio and film and television to psychologically condition the public to accept the tenets of cultural Marxism. In particular, its views on the family, on authority, on law, on race, etc. And uh, Adorno and a man by the name of Horkheimer, who was the head of the Mark Frankfurt School, they went to Hollywood in, during the Second World War. And to this day, Hollywood is cultural Marxism's most powerful weapon. To this day. That's the first uh, incursion of the cultural Marxists. The second is this, something called studies in prejudice. Now, the Frankfurt School sought to stigmatize Christian culture by defining its expressions on sexual morality, on uh, what the family was, and on paternal authority as prejudices, nefarious prejudices. And they did this in a wide-ranging uh, uh, series of academic studies. Now, the most influential of these was, uh, again, this man Theodore Adorno in his book, the, and I quote here, The Authoritarian Personality, written in 1950, which created what he called an F scale, connecting traditional Christian views on the family and sexuality to varying degrees of fascism. To this day, a person who is under the sway of political correctness will anathematize his or her opponents on matters related to the Christian notion of the family or sexual ethics by accusing them of being fascists. Now you know where that came from. Because the fascists, as in, as in the real fascists, Hitler and so forth, they were also homosexuals, practicing. Very common in Nazi Germany, it had nothing to do with fascism. But that phrase, fascism tied to the Nazis, was put on Christians and Christian values. That's Adorno's work. Most of you have never heard of Adorno. You have certainly been called a fascist by holding to Christian sexual morality. I would gain, uh, I would almost certainly say that's true. Third area, critical theory. This is probably known to us, though not in connection with cultural Marxism. Now, the purpose of critical theory is not to develop discernment, which in the uh, tradition of the West it would have been. To critique something is to subject it to the rules of logic. To develop discernment, which is a mark of the Holy Spirit for that matter. But that is not the interest of critical theory. The interest of critical theory practiced by the cultural Marxists is simply to denigrate and criticize its opponents. So it's critical in the wholly negative sense. There is no positive in critical theory. It simply defines, it never defines what it proposes, it simply says, I'm against this. Now, Joe and I encounter this all the time in the media. Our opponents are against this, you ask them what they stand for, and they'll say things like po progress and inclusion and so forth. But then there's nothing behind that, and then there is nothing behind it, it's just a gesture. They are identified by what they're against, not what they're in favor. That's still a religious perspective. But there's nothing there, it's an empty balloon. You can puncture it very easily. I think that we do a reasonable job of that. But again, I think it's an easy thing to do. You got some uh, empty suits there. Now, critical theory underlies the academic approach taken by e virtually every university in the Western world. It subjects every traditional institution, beginning with the family, uh, to unremitting criticism and assault, with the only purpose being to bring it down. 
you will recognize critical theory in terms of the departments that it has spawned. Its influence goes beyond them, but let me identify a few of those. Cultural studies. Cultural studies is cultural Marxism. Women's studies, cultural Marxism. Aboriginal studies, cultural Marxism. African-American studies, LGBT studies, post-colonial studies. Per political correctness is particularly strong in these areas of, quote, study, which is, as I say, they don't actually study anything. They attack the Christian view on things. That's the common ground. Note how they all work together as well. That is their, con it's a common enemy. Now, the products of uh, people that come through these studies, and some of you may have, so I don't mean to belittle you, but there is almost invariably an implacable anger and hostility towards the West in general and Christian, Christendom in particular and Christianity. So if you're a white male like me, you're in for it just by being a white male. You don't even have to be Christian. If you are a Christian, even further, if you're an evangelical, oh, even further. If you're a Baptist, good grief. I became a faith in my first year of my PhD, and I get attacked by older men because I sound like their father. And I represent all the bad things in their past that they want to get away from. And they think that I've never come out, and I haven't really looked at the world. I think, have you any idea of what my background is? It doesn't matter. They're not really thinking anyway. There's just hostility. Final point, domination. Marx argued that history is economically determined. Those who own the means of production have the power and they determine the course of society. But the Frankfurt School, in accordance with their reimagining precisely who constituted the proletariat, not just the working man, but the, uh, the, but the women and the criminals and the gays and uh, the racial, different racial groups, uh, they argued that history was determined by identity group. Whichever group, whether male or female, black or white, religious or irreligious, gay or straight, was in a position of social approval, had by virtue of that fact dominance over other groups and was suppressing the other groups. All forms of traditional authority were in their sight legitimate. Criminals were, by virtue of their condemnation, good. Their judges were bad. They were judgmental. They didn't understand that they were not to judge. Simply by virtue of their position in society, they were pri privileged. They were structural oppressors. And the Frankfurt School was particularly influential in passing this form of teaching on into the public school system because it fit so nicely with the influence of the progressivist educator, John Dewey. Now, I've written about Dewey in a previous installment of Jubilee magazine. Uh, Dewey taught that it was irrelevant if children were taught specific skills or facts. In fact, for the f education of the future, they needed to be schooled not in what, what uh, was a fact, what was, but rather in what ought to be for the future. Not in the being of things, but the becoming of things. For change. What mattered to him was that they were well-adjusted. That's his quote, well-adjusted. Now, you all know the significance of being a well-adjusted person. Everyone wants to be well-adjusted. If you're a Christian, you are not well-adjusted. Everyone knows that I'm not well-adjusted. Still beautiful, but not well-adjusted. <laughs> now, this made them, uh, as I say, the progressivists in the public school system absolutely fertile ground for the culture of Marxists to come in and simply to change what was meant by being well-adjusted. Now it meant including and endorsing the gay lifestyle, which isn't the gay lifestyle, it's the sodomite lifestyle. The word gay is a, a term invented in the 19th century, or homosexual, as opposed to heterosexual. Somebody I've read recently said, uh, the word homosexual is never used in the Bible, which is true. Neither is the word heterosexual. It's not used. That's because both of them are inventions of the 19th century. Is sodomy condemned in scripture? Most clearly. But homosexuality is not. Absolutely true. 
I'm gonna, have we got the wheel of oppression here? This is what is presented to undergraduates in their universities. This is a, uh, you've heard the term white privilege. Here's how the wheel works. The closer you are to the center, the more, uh, the more privilege, power, access, and resources you have. Note that uh, to be the most, the closest to privilege, power, access, and resources is to be a white, male, uh, ruling, wealthy, US-born or Canadian-born, able-bodied, Protestant, heterosexual. I'm all of those but wealthy. <laughs> but note, on the outside of this wheel, so you've got Native American at the top, intersex, on welfare, foreign-born, can't speak English, have a mental disability, and are either Buddhist, Muslim, or Hindu, you may wonder at that portrait, and pansexual. If you are all of those things, boy, you've hit the jackpot. Certainly get a job in the public university. You'll be included in some policy, absolutely, for sure. The uh, inclusion of the Muslim as, as an oppressed minority group is extraordinary. So is Hinduism, for that matter, because Hindus are dependent on a caste system, <laughs> and a, a caste system which is unchangeable. If you're a Brahmin, it's all well and good, but if you are one of the untouchables, you're not even a human being. You can do what you, what, whatever you like. And yet, these are the oppressed minorities, according to what's taught in the public universities. Now, things I want to note, you, note to you about this. All of these are, de are dependent on the idea of group rights, according to identity groups, identity characteristics, as opposed to personal rights. A personal right is dependent on being a person. A person is defined by being in the image of God who is tri-personal. Significant here. There is a cultural determinism here, dependent on the Darwinian idea that we are a species, right? The origin of the species. Human beings are a species just like other animals. They're a soulless species, determined by our skin color or sexual preferences or whatever. Uh, because of this, the structural injustice is, is entirely based on what you can identify. The only means of rectifying this social injustice, since we don't believe in God, is to physically remove those who are in the center and push them to the margins and push those on the margins into the middle. That's how we bring about social justice. Furthermore, we all must become activists to change the structure because only then can there be social justice, right? So if you're white, male, all those things, and you're not actually being mean to anybody, you're still a cultural oppressor, and you have to work to subvert the system. That's being taught in the public schools. Now, let me talk about Marcuse very briefly, and this is uh, where I want to conclude. He talked about the, uh, the significance of um, following up on the work of William Reich on uh, liberating a non-procreative eros through what he called polymorphous perversity. He destigmatized every sexual expression except that of heterosexual marital relations, which he stigmatized as being marked by sexual repression. It's part of the F scale. You're on the F scale. And he also created a new class of victim group, the sexual deviant, and allied them to the blacks and the feminists to compose a potent co coalition which was identified as the new left. Now this broke the age-long antipathy of the working classes towards homosexuals. Put them in the same group. But if you're working class, to be, there's a repugnance there even in the working class, but this brought them under the same umbrella and allowed them to work together on this. Still strong, very strong created phobias, uh, Marcuse did. Now, the cultural Marxist difficulty in the U.S. was that the Americans preferred freedom with personal responsibility and Christian virtue within the context of the family to the tyrannical state of equality that they noted in Europe. We don't want that equality. So how does he answer this problem? We gotta get around this. Well, Marcuse's answer is to launch, launch the most successful venture in critical theory of all, an attack on tolerance. This is where I'm gonna conclude. 
in his 1965 essay, Repressive Tolerance, the title of this lecture. Marcuse criticized the inherited notion, inherited from John Locke, throughout the Anglophone world, by deeming that what it regarded as fair play, fair play was a, 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 a matter of repression. Even when we are trying to be fair-minded or impartial, the virtues of the liberal-minded academic or the impartial judge or the free press, um, and the acknowledged civil society, basis of the civil society, these needed to be attacked according to Marcuse. Because, and I quote, the tolerance expressed, expressed in such alleged impartiality serves to minimize or even absolve prevailing intolerance or suppression. In other words, it assumes the Christian faith is true. And that is, according to him, an injustice and the thing he wants to get rid of. So we have to attack the notion of tolerance and subvert it and change what we mean by tolerance. Now, the liberal society that had arisen from them, and if those of you who are older would have grown up with this, was based, according to Marcuse, on a very subtle form of structural domination that civil society had come to accept, even if it meant endemic structural injustice. And tolerance could only become good if what he called non-dominating non ideas were allowed to flourish. And that was only possible if, again, the dominating ideas expressed in this wheel were put down. And I quote again, the realization of the objective of tolerance would call for intolerance towards prevailing policies, attitudes, opinions, and the extension of tolerance to policies, attitudes, and opinions which are outlawed or suppressed. So what has been outlawed must become the law. What was the law needs to be outlawed. And I quote again, it is necessary to break the established universe of meaning and the practice enclosed in this universe in order to enable man to find out what is true and false, to become truly autonomous, to find by themselves what is true and what is false for man in the existing society. In order to do that, they will have to be freed from the prevailing indoctrination, which they don't even recognize as indoctrination. So the political virtue that I grew up with, which is tolerating with those with whom we disagree. I, you know, I disagree. I think you are an absolute moron. But I will fight to the death for your right to say it because that's the product of being in a free country. That's the tolerance I grew up with. That is no longer the tolerance that we have now. What Mark, Mark Hughes called his form of tolerance is liberating tolerance. What I call tolerance is repressive tolerance. Note how he inverts the phrases. So there's a doublespeak, an Orwellian doublespeak here. It meant that agreement with all the ideas and movements from cultural Marxism uh, was liberating. It also meant that we needed to suppress what had previously been called being liberal-minded, fair-minded. What was once, uh, and it had to be termed right. Now, and he clarified this in a 1968 postscript to that essay that I referred to earlier. As against the virulent, this is a tough quotation to finish with, as against the virulent denunciations that such a policy would do away with the sacred liberalistic principle of equality for the other side, I maintain that there are issues where either there is no other side or in, in any more than a formalistic sense, or where the other side is demonstrably regressive and impedes possible improvement of the human condition. To tolerate propaganda for inhumanity, in other words, Christianity, vitiates, that is, undermines, destroys the goals not only of liberal, liberalism, but of every progressive political philo philosophy. So he totally turns around tolerance to become intolerant of even those who are tolerant or were tolerant. And now those who are in the center are deemed to be those who are intolerant, not just by their views, but by their very existence. This is the work of cultural Marxism. I have hopefully identified it for you. I haven't come to any attempt to solve the problem. That will we'll save for later speakers, but that's the nature of the problem and where it came about. Okay, thank you.